Well, uh, welcome to Youth Sunday at Pine Grove Baptist Church. Uh, if you paid attention to the date at the end of that video, that's wrong. That was for last year. Uh, so there'll be an announcement about the parade uh, coming up in just a little bit. But I just wanted to come out and welcome you, first of all, uh, uh, and encourage you to join with us in worship. This uh, service is going to be mostly run by the youth, uh, but it's not a program. We're not doing it for attention on ourselves. Uh, we want this to be a time of worship, so we want you guys to join into worship with us. Um, but with that, all that being said, I'm just going to get out of the way and let them get started, and then I will speak to you guys in a little bit later. So please worship with us this morning. Can you guys hear me? 
All right, I'm pretending to be the youth pastor today. He's not cool, so don't worry about him. Okay, I'm going to do your announcements for you real fast. All right, first of all, there will be a short business meeting today after the service. And then the Living World Sunday School class will be joining the Gospel Light Sun class in the sanctuary. And next Saturday will be, we will have a special Palm Sunday service. Invite your friends and your families. Um, please see announcements for, for the MAV Easter Parade and arrested, please see, well, please be at the old St. Joe's Hospital parking lot between 10.30 and 11 o'clock on Saturday. Okay, then I'm going to give you a short devotion, and my first devotion um, verse will be Proverbs 6, well, 16, 3, commit to the Lord whatever you do, and he will establish your plans. And what I think it meant to me was trust him with your plans. And then I got one more to t- talk to you about. Uh, Colossians 3.23, whatever you do, work at with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. And what that one meant to me, work hard for the Lord. And that's my devotion and announcements. Thank you. you bow with me, please? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing everyone to come here today. Uh, When we worship today, I pray for everyone here to feel the courage to surrender themselves to your will, that your word reaches everyone's minds today, and when everyone walks out those doors, they will apply your word to their everyday life. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.
can hardly think as you call me deeper still as you call help Sean out. I was a little worried about him there for a minute. What was holding him to the chair? Why couldn't they move him out of the chair? What did it mean? What was the sign that they held up at the end? Sin. When he sat in this chair, he got um, consumed by sin, didn't he? How about we move this back a little bit so you guys can come up away from the cross. I'm afraid you might get hurt on it. Come on up a little bit more. 
All right, while we're getting settled, parents, I have a few quick announcements. Oh, be really careful. Yikes, especially with your leg. You okay? All right, parents, real quick. As Braden said, next Sunday is Palm Sunday. Okay, it's a very special service. You don't want to miss it. It's not going to be any like any other Sunday, okay? And you guys, we're going to be you're going to stay up here for church, okay? Cuz you don't want to miss it. And if you've been baptized, you get to take communion with us, okay? We're going to have communion next week, okay? Now, if you want to help us, hey boys, let's not play with that. Um, if you want to help with the Palm Sunday service, parents have them downstairs in the fellowship hall and the pre-K, just the toddlers, the pre-K class can join us as well. They're going to help us come bring Jesus in, okay? You get to dress up with us real quick and bring Jesus in for Palm Sunday. If you want to do that, be downstairs, meet me downstairs at 930, okay? And then after... Um, their part in that, you all will get to go back to your parents and the preschoolers will go to their class, okay? Also, um, okay, so you're, you're good. All right, also at the Welcome Center, please make sure we're going to have a really fun Easter event on April 20th from, from 1 to 3. And I need to know if you're coming so I have enough stuff for everybody. So make sure you sign up either at the Welcome Center or on Facebook, okay? And the special volunteer luncheon, if you would like to get involved in the children's ministry or you're already a part of it at any level, please join us for that training on April 28th, right after church, and I'll provide lunch, okay? All right, enough with announcements. Are you all ready? Give me a sad face if you've ever had your feelings hurt. Has anybody ever hurt your feelings? Your sister... Yeah. People at school, maybe. Maybe even your parents. That happens sometimes. I heard Elizabeth's feelings last night, actually. It happens, doesn't it? When, when our feelings get hurt, our heart kind of hurts, doesn't it? And we, we might get really sad or we might get mad. Has it ever made you mad when somebody hurts your feelings? Yeah, be honest. We've all been there. Have you all ever read a book by, um, about the rainbow fish? Yes. There are several books about rainbow fish. Um, this was the only one I had. It's not um, the story that we're going to talk about this morning, but I thought it would help um, stir your memory if you've seen rainbow fish before. Okay? You've read all of them except this one. Well, maybe we'll have to let you read this one someday. All right. Now. Rainbow Fish is, is a good example of teaching us about sharing. Remember, he, sh he shared his shiny scales in one book, okay, with his fish friends. But um, in a different story called Rainbow Fish and the Big Blue Whale Tail, have you read that one? Awesome. I haven't read it yet, but I liked the, what the story was about um, when I read a, a, little, uh, a little story about that book. Um what you like that story a lot well it's going to teach us a little lesson about forgiveness today okay okay um one day rainbow fish was with his fish friends and they were eating some shrimp okay they were all together a big a big group of fish is called a what a school a school of fish right and they were all hungry so they were gathering up some shrimp to eat and this old whale was kind of by himself just watching them and he was hungry too and he eats shrimp too but most of all he just enjoyed watching them swim because they were so beautiful all their shiny scales were glimmering and he just liked to watch them he wasn't bothering anybody he was just watching them but it made this the fish a little nervous because why do you think it would make them nervous Whales eat fish. You're right. So they thought, oh, oh no, look at that mean old whale. He's going to come over here and eat us. We better do something, right? Well, some time went by, and they, they were still a little nervous. And the whale came back and was watching them again. And he was close enough to hear them talking. And one fish said, why is that old whale staring at us? Who knows what he's thinking? Look at that giant mouth. He's eating all the shrimp. 
What if he eats all the shrimp and comes after us? Oh, how do you think that whale felt? Mm. Probably made him really sad. He was just watching them. He wasn't bothering anybody. And then they made it even worse. They called him a wicked whale. Oh, and that really hurt his feelings. And guess what? Not only did it hurt his feelings, it made him angry. And whales are huge, aren't they? They could do some damage, okay? Yeah, yeah. He could do some major damage. And um, he chased those fish all the way back to their cave, and he really stirred up the water. Now, when there's a lot of stirring of the water, what happens to all the shrimp? What happens to it? They get trapped in the current. Does it kind of scare them away? Does it kind of scare them away? When 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 other fish see big fish coming, it kind of scares them away, right? So what happened when those little rainbow fish and, and all his friends came out of the cave? Did they have anything to eat? No. The whale had scared them away. So the fish grew really, really hungry, and they were looking around for something to eat. But the whale had scared them all away. And you know what? They got to thinking. They went to the, the whale, and they apologized they, for hurting their feelings because they couldn't find any fish to eat. The whale couldn't find any shrimp to eat. They were all hungry, all, all because of a big misunderstanding. They went and talked to the whale, and he said, Man, you all really hurt my feelings. I wasn't bothering you. Why did you have to go and say those things? And sometimes we get hurt like the rainbow fish and the whale. We get scared because we don't understand what's going on. We misunderstand people's intentions, right? We don't really know their hearts and their mind. We don't understand what's going on. Okay? And then we get our feelings hurt and we get mad and we make things worse, don't we? You, you might easily cry. That happens. Yeah, sometimes we get real filled with emotions and we cry. But should we stay angry? What finally happened to help them get this figured out? What finally happened? They talked to each other. Sometimes if you're upset with somebody, you just got to go talk it out. And a lot of times I bet you're going to find it was just a misunderstanding. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, if you talk it out, sometimes they'll apologize. Sometimes they won't. But at least you'll, you'll know the truth. Hey, boys, that's nothing to play with. Please get your fingers away from that, okay? All right. If we stay so angry so long, we, sometimes we don't even remember what we were mad at each other about, okay? All right. I want everybody, I want to treat you guys like preschoolers because some of you are acting like preschoolers. Open them, both hands, close them, give them a clap. Open them, close them, put them in your lap, and stop touching each other, okay? I don't care who did it first, just stop doing it now. So the Bible gives us a scripture in Colossians. Everybody say Colossians 3.13. It says, remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others, okay? Even though it's really hard sometimes, and it's usually a misunderstanding, sometimes they, people mean to be hurtful. But we have to forgive others just like Jesus forgave us. All right, just look without touching, Maddox. I've asked you several times. Look at that cross. What did Jesus do on that cross? He died for our sins. Jesus was perfect. He didn't deserve to die on that, but he forgave us. And he laid down his life for us. So if he can do that for us, do you think we can forgive somebody for saying something mean to us? I think we can, okay? All right. Let's say a little prayer before we go downstairs, all right? Everybody close your eyes. You ready? Lord, help us to remember everybody has a bad day now and again. Please teach us to think the best of people. And when people hurt us, teach us to forgive them just like Jesus forgives us. And not to hold grudges that rob us the joy of our friendships and our fellowship. And Lord, most of all, show us how to love each other just like Jesus loved us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Bow with me, please. Thank you, God, for letting everyone arrive here safely so we can all worship you today. Thank you for all the great weather you have given us for the past week. And please allow this offering to be used in the building of your kingdom. Amen.
be my guide and hold me to your side and I will love you to the end Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path Thy word Now you should be able to hear me, I think. I think I just turned it on. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, I, I want to say uh, how proud I am of all the youth and the leaders that got up there and did things that were a little bit out of their comfort zone. Can we give them all a round of applause in their time? <laughs> yes, thank you very much, guys, for starting off our worship service the right way. Um, I appreciate your willingness to step out of your comfort zone. Uh, hopefully this is the beginning of... Uh, more often that you will see them up here doing different things and they will continue to grow in that. So pray for them as they continue to decipher their gifts and where they are able to serve. Uh, before uh, I get started with my uh, sermon, there's going to be a video that we're going to show. Uh, this video will be familiar to most of the youth and uh, probably to some of you. And it, it focuses on a, a, a member of the Passion Week story, the Easter story, that isn't talked about a whole lot. Uh, typically, when we run into his name, we just kind of skim over him. Um, and the video, it, it's not short. It does have a little bit of a length to it, but I think it will keep your attention. So um, I'm going to read for you the scripture that talks about him, and then we'll, we'll play that video for you. So I'm in Luke chapter 23, starting with the verse 13. It says, Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was inciting the people to rebellion. I have examined him in your presence and have found no basis for your charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us, as you can see. He has done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I will punish him and then release him. Of course, they're talking about Jesus. With one voice they cried out, Away with this man! Release Barabbas to us! Barabbas had been thrown into prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again, but they kept shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! For the third time he spoke to them, Why? What crime has this man committed? I have found in him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore, I will have him punished and then release him. But with loud shouts, they incessantly demanded that he be crucified, and their shouts prevailed. So Pilate decided to grant their demand he released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, the one they asked for, being Barabbas, and surrendered Jesus to their will. Go ahead, John. We see the story of Jesus going to the cross and everything seems to kind of be hand in hand. And then there's this one character that seems to interrupt the narrative. His name's Barabbas. We don't even know much about him except that he's a murderer, a leader of an insurrection, a rebel. And 
why he's even mentioned, sometimes I'm not so sure. It's like, what? Let's, this is about Jesus going to the cross. So in this moment, Pilate thinks, I hold the destinies of these two men in my hand. I know the Jews have a tradition that on a holy day, I will release one of the prisoners on death row. Pilate stands on this audacious stage who now presents Jesus, son of the living God, versus Barabbas, the thug and rebel. He says, all right, who do you want? This is blasphemy. This is, this is gone too far. There's no comparison. This is a rightful prisoner, a man who should be on death row. He's a rebel against Rome. He leads a rebellion. He murders people. He's a bad man. He's a thug and he's a crook. He deserves the chains and he deserves the crucifixion. Jesus, what has he done but heal, restore, deliver, set free, open blind eyes, open deaf ears, heal the lame and the leper? What, what has Jesus done? Who do you want? We want Barabbas. Yeah, give us Barabbas. People say, give us Barabbas. The Roman soldiers come up and they put the key in and they unlock Barabbas from his chains and shackles. And he walks down the platform, welcomed by all of his thug friends. Yeah, the people love me. Yeah, that's right. I don't even know who this Jesus guy is, but all I know is my people love me. There seems to be no conscience in Barabbas. There's no record of him turning to Jesus and saying, I owe you everything now, for you have set me free. No, I don't see any of that in Barabbas. And God knew that. Jesus stood there, silent, for he knew the will of the Father. He said, it's fine, Father. Let him have Barabbas. For Jesus knew that the Father would have to treat Jesus like Barabbas so he could treat Barabbas like Jesus. Barabbas thought it was the people that set him free. No, 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 no. It was the love of a heavenly father. When I look at the story, I realize who Barabbas really is. That's me. That's you. That's us. And I felt I was reading this the other day, and I felt God speak to me. I love Barabbas. I love him. But God, he's a bad man. I love him. And I wanted him to go free. But didn't you know that he probably would have never acknowledged the free get? Yeah, but I love Barabbas. For while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God sent his son for Barabbas. Even the one he knew would walk away from Jesus and his free gift and never come back. He loves them. And the nerve, the call, and the audacity of believers to think, I got saved by grace, but now that I'm in this deep, dark place of bondage, I'm going to work hard to get myself out. What? That's the opposite of the gospel. Are you bound? Are you held under the power of this temptation, this sin? Do you feel like it's controlling you? What are you going to do? I'm going to shake myself free. Stop it! No, you won't! You're no match for the powers of hell and the urges of sin will not overcome it and you will never overcome it. You'll just be another statistic. There's no answer within yourself. Your own marriage, your own goodness, your own discipline, your own devotion will not save your marriage and will not save your kids. There's only one. And he's the one that took your place. He's the one that stood silently on the platform with Pilate and said, yes, let him have Barabbas. Take me. How many times have I stood on that platform with Pilate and Jesus and I'm the Barabbas and they start to take my chains off and I say, no, no, I deserve this. I deserve the guilt. I deserve the shame. I deserve the consequences.
consequence. I deserve it. Jesus seems to look at me and say, no, son. Let me have it. Let me have your sin. Let me have your pain. No, God, I did it to myself. I deserve it. My marriage won't make it. This is what I deserve. I deserve divorce. I deserve poverty. I deserve sickness. I deserve it all. No. God, I say, I'm so ashamed. Give me your shame. But God, what if I do it again? I'll still be here. Oh God, I don't want to hurt you. I love you. I, I don't want to do this anymore. Give me your sins, son. This is all we got. It's all I got. It's all you got. We can play games. We can play church games. We can pretend like some people are better than others and that's why they're blessed. Or we can all come to the honest conclusion that it's God. And it's God alone. The greatest challenge is not your discipline, your devotion, your focus. Your greatest challenge is believing the gospel. Could it be that there's a God with a love so scandalous, so wide, so deep, so vast, so high, so expansive, so welcoming, so inclusive? Let me have your sin, son. Okay. And I give him my sin. And I stand in this empty space of forgiveness and acceptance while Jesus walks off to the cross that I deserve. I see him, I see him walking to the post to be whipped. As I stand a free man, all the attention is turned now. And I feel the love of God saying, go son, live your life. I'll pay the price. Where did we get off thinking that we were going to set ourselves free? It's still Jesus. It'll always be Jesus. It'll never stop being the power of Jesus. If His blood is sufficient for your salvation, His blood is sufficient to sustain you through every challenge and every sin and every temptation. Jesus is enough. We are Barabbas in that story. Not exactly, but he's an example of the sin that we have. We deserve punishment for our sins. But luckily, God's mercy and His grace had a different idea. Uh, we're going to be in Romans for the duration of, of the time. If you want to turn to Romans chapter 4, we'll start with verse 25. That's the last verse in chapter 4. We deserve the punishment for our sins. But God made a way. Romans chapter 4, verse 25. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. <coughs> Jesus took our place. His death was to cover our sins. It was to take away everything that we've done wrong, every mistake that we've made, to give us the opportunity to reconcile ourselves with God. He was the perfect sacrifice we needed to rectify our lives with Christ. To get back into communion with Him, we had to have a blood sacrifice, and Jesus made that possible. Despite having the ability the entire time to scream no and remove Himself from that, He was obedient and went to the cross. Uh, there's a, a, 
uh, drama that I saw back home whenever I was a teenager, and this one point in it still sticks with me. I think it was uh, Judgment House. So it was like their Easter thing uh, for, uh, or I'm sorry, their Halloween thing, but they did it at the church. And a lot of it was about drug abuse and things of that nature and um, the testimony that we share. Uh, but the point that sticks to me is you, we went into this small classroom, and there was probably about eight to ten of us lined up against the wall. And the only thing in that room is a, a, an actor portraying Jesus with the cross on his shoulder and two Roman soldiers. And they're frozen at first whenever we walk into the room, and then the, the action starts, and they start whipping Jesus. And they start beating him as he's carrying the cross, dragging it across his room. And at one point, as he's, he's halfway across the room, the, the actor stops. He says, stop! And everything freezes, and he threw the cross down. And then he turned to us, and he got into our face, and he was yelling at us, why do I have to die for you? Why should I go to this cross? I've done nothing wrong. And he goes on this long rant about... about his perfect life and about all that he's done and that he's perfectly in communion with the Father and that he doesn't deserve this. And at the very end, he says, I love you. That's why. And he picks the cross back up and put it on his shoulder. And then the beatings ensued again. He took that. And I know that that's an actor's portrayal and that's not 100% biblical, but it, it left an imprint because he didn't have to do that. God didn't have to make a way for us to be reconciled with us, with him. But he chose to. And Jesus was that sacrifice. He took our punishment. The death for our sins. But not only that, if we look at the second part of the verse. And he was raised to life for our justification. See, God didn't just leave us forgiven. He didn't just leave us there. But he justified us. This word that is used justification here is dikaiosis. It's found only twice, uh, both times right here close in the book of Romans. Uh, we see other forms of the word, but the dikaiosis means in the old Greek, the pressing need to be released from deserved punishment. The second definition it gave was within the context. It says divine approval, emphasizing Christ's full payment for our sin. Christ's full payment for our sin. So it's not just like the, the sacrificial system that the Jews had before that, where the sacrifice covered their sin for a time, and then the next time they sinned, it would, they would have to have another one. This justified us forever. We're not just forgiven, we're justified. All we have to do is accept that gift that He's already given for us. I'm going to pick up now, and I'm going to read chapter 5, verses 1 through 7, if you'll follow along with me. It starts off, therefore, that therefore pointing back to what we just talked about, that Jesus died for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into the, this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings. Because we know that sufferings produce perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God has poured out His love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom He has given us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might die. Dare to die. So that verse 1, therefore, it's therefore because of Christ's crucifixion for his justification, for his resurrection. You see, if Christ stayed dead, it wouldn't have done any good. The devil would have won. He would have had his victory. But Christ didn't stay dead. He was resurrected on the third day. And therefore, because of that justification, we gained through that. We have peace. With God through Jesus Christ. And this peace that it talks about is not just a feeling. It's not just a, you know, okay, I feel calm about this. I feel okay about it. It's not just like the quiet before the storm. It's not just like a nice sunny day sitting on your deck. This is an overwhelming, encompassing peace. 
It's peace because of the new relationship that we have with God, the confidence that we can have since we are adopted into His family. It's not like a relationship that has been renewed from your childhood or from your even now where a girlfriend breaks up with you and you guys are apart for a while and you get back together, but you're feeling at peace about it because that relationship still has baggage. There's still stuff going on there with any relationship that was estranged and then fixed. But here, with God, we get a 100% fresh start with no baggage. Verse 2 goes on to talk about how Jesus grants us access to God the Father by our faith. I like how it says at the end of that verse, in the, in the grace that we now stand. We're already there if you've accepted Christ. You're already standing in grace. We should live like we're standing in grace. Jesus grants us access to God the Father by our faith, our belief in Him. But we need to rejoice in the hope that we have, the hope in the glory of God. And it's not a worldly hope. You see, these words in English sometimes get tossed around and they lose their meaning, they lose their passion, they lose their emphasis. But this hope we have isn't like, I hope we go to the movies later, or I hope my favorite team wins. It's not a hope like that, but it's a, a confident, expectant hope, knowing that God has us. That's why it goes on to say that we can be confident in it in just a few verses. But it's a confident, expecting hope. We know that God is in control and that He has us in His hand, that we are adopted into His family. Verse 3 goes on to say that not only so that we rejoice, but also in our sufferings. Now, it's easy to have hope in good times. It's easy to have hope whenever things are going well, whenever we feel good about life, whenever everything just seems to be cruising right along. But in our sufferings, we're still supposed to have hope. But not just have hope, but rejoice in the hope that we have. But why? We rejoice in our sufferings because we know that sufferings produce perseverance. Starting with verse 4. Perseverance, character, character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us. How often are prayers and requests to God to remove the sufferings from our life? We don't rejoice in our sufferings. We run from our sufferings as fast as we can. We do whatever we can to remove any amount of suffering in our life. We want the easiest road possible in life. But without suffering, we don't have the opportunity to persevere. We don't have the opportunity to lean upon God's strength. Uh, And I thought about a a cool example of suffering. Uh, How many people are paying attention to the NCAA basketball tournament? A few of you? Fell out of bracket anyway and just kind of watching the scoreboard to see how bad your bracket got blown up. Well, last year, does anybody remember the game that blew up everybody's bracket? It was one of the first games, one of the first weekend games. UVA, the first one seed to get beat by a 16 seed. Never happened before. And some said that it would never happen. But they were the first team as a one seed, as one of the four best teams in the college basketball, to get beat by a 16, one of the teams that barely made it in the tournament. By UMBC, if I remember right. Some no-name school that we've never heard of before. Well, they got beat in the first round of the tournament last year. This year, they're in the championship game playing Monday night. So without that suffering being a, an experienced team and going through that trial to be the first one under that microscope of falling on their face that big way. And they didn't just lose by like one shot at the buzzer. They got beat handily. But now they were able to come back and persevere through that and they find themselves the following year in the championship game. Without our sufferings, we can't persevere. And it's through that perseverance that we gain character. Character. You know, the, the, the real person that you are, the experience that you have, the wisdom that you carry, the person you are whenever the doors are closed and the lights are up and nobody knows what you're doing, that character, it creates in you a character that leads to hope. 
We as a human race want to avoid suffering at all costs, but suffering is part of the process at times. How do you purify gold? With fire. Or I found another, with the fire is called cupellation, if I'm pronouncing that right, and then there's another form with acid, inquartation. Uh, but both, neither of those sound pleasant, being held under fire or being held under acid to burn off the impurities. Paul said it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10, That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insult, in hardships, in persecution, and in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. We rejoice and have joy in all situations, for the bad times allow us to lean upon His strength. We need to realize that in those moments where we don't feel like we can go on, when we don't feel like we deserve it, when we don't feel like there's anything in our power that we can do, those are the opportunities where God has the greatest opportunity to show up in our lives and show the world. How many times from Genesis to Revelation do we see God choose the lowly and raise them up? Choose the second born. Choose the smallest tribe. Choose the smallest son. Over and over again, He takes the weak to shame the strong. So when we are weak, God has the opportunity to be strong within us. In the sufferings, we persevere. And we persevere and it creates character. And our character gives us a hope. Picking up at verse 5. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out His love for us into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom He has given. He poured out His love on us and gave us the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, the third part of the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, God is literally living within the hearts of the believers. And we discount His power. We remain timid. We remain quiet. We don't allow the power of the Holy Spirit to move in our life. We walk around like we're trying to do everything ourselves. The Holy Spirit is 100% God. And He literally lives within us, giving us His power if we choose to allow Him to work through us. I'm going to continue reading verses 6 and 7. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for the righteous man, Though for a good man, some might dare to die. Jesus died for the ungodly. For us, just at the right time. It was part of his plan from creation. It was part of his plan from the beginning. Satan thought he'd won whenever he got Jesus on that cross. But three days later, the resurrection changed the whole narrative. Jesus defeated hell and the devil and death and justified us. He died when we were powerless. Notice that it says, when we were powerless. Because, ladies and gentlemen, we are powerless no longer. We serve a mighty God, and He's with us. And He lives within us. Verse 7 goes on to say, it just talks about that, some, that people won't die for someone else. Maybe for a righteous man, they might take their place. But it's pointed out there because we don't have to become righteous before we approach the throne of God. We don't have to fix our lives before we come to the foot of the cross. Christ died for us while we were evil, while we were ungodly. Some may die for the good people, but who would have taken Barabbas' place? A, rebel, a rebellious leader led an insurrection, murdered somebody. We don't know a whole lot about him. But we wouldn't take the place of a murderer and serve his, his penalty on death row or even life in prison. We wouldn't take their place. But that's what Jesus did for us. I'm going to ask the youth and the leaders to go ahead and join, go back up into the choir loft. And I'm going to close with this one verse at the end. And it's a, it's a familiar one. You've probably heard it before. But verse 8 in chapter 5 says, But God demonstrates His own love for us, 
while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It was God's love that saved us. It was nothing else. There's nothing we've done. There's no reason for any of us to become righteous or be holier than thou because we are all sinners deserving of death. But God demonstrated his love for us where he sent his son to die while we were still sinners. It is still Jesus. It's always been Jesus. It will never stop being Jesus. Jesus Christ is enough. We can't set ourselves free, folks. We can't do it. We, we can't be good enough. We can't work hard enough. We can't save ourselves except through surrender. But Jesus' blood can. In Him is our salvation. All we have to do is accept it. The work's been done. The crucifixion and resurrection have happened around 2,000 years ago. We don't have to worry about it. All we have to do is accept that. And He will sustain you through every challenge. He has poured out His power to help you defeat every sin and every temptation. Everything that we go through, the Bible tells us that if there's a temptation, God gives us a way out. We are never stuck in a corner where the only answer is to sin. There's always an escape from that. The cross is here just for a couple more weeks. And ESPN has an update. But the cross is here. And I encourage you, before it goes, if there's anything, any prayer requests you want to bring forward to, while we sing this last song, to come up and, and nail it to the cross. But more importantly, if there's anything that you've been struggling with personally, if there's a sin in your life that you just can't seem to tackle, if there's a heaviness in your life that you just can't seem to get rid of, if there's something you need to surrender, maybe it's not necessarily a sin, but a pocket of your life that you've walled off from God, and you're like, no, God, I got this part. If there's something you need to surrender, please come up and nail it to the cross. I'll be up here to, to pray with you if anybody needs. But don't let this moment pass. If there's something you need to do, bring it to the cross. Please stand and sing with us. You spoke a word and life began Told oceans where to start and where to end You said motion, time and space But still you come and you call to me by name But still you come and you call to me by name you can hold the stars in place You can hold my heart the same Whenever I fall away Whenever I start to break So here I am, left in of my heart To the one who holds the stars 
business meeting that will follow uh, this prayer and uh, if you have some time go up to a youth and tell them how awesome they did this morning let me pray for you dear Heavenly Father thank you so much for the opportunity to worship you this morning God I pray that each person will examine their lives during this Easter season and see if we are fully sacrificed to you that we have surrendered our life to you God if there's anything we are holding back I pray that you will continue to put it upon our hearts so that we are willing to let go of ourselves. God, I just pray that as we leave this place, we either now or after Sunday school, that you will direct our path, that you will give us an opportunity to show your love to others. God, we love you. Thank you for that sacrifice on the cross. Thank you for all that you've done for us. In your holy name I pray. Amen. In the eye of the storm, you remain in control. And in the middle of the war, you guard my soul. You alone are the anchor when my sails are torn. Your love surrounds me in the eye of the storm. 